Thank you, Carla. Uh, do I see Maria Elena Estrada here? I don't know if she's there, uh, the curator of this year's Biennale. Uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction. I must correct, I'm not a professor. I'm a very hands-on designer, engaged every day with creating things. I have been involved a little bit here and there, uh, invited to universities, uh, but I have great respect for professors, and I don't want to steal that title. I am an industrial designer, full stop. Uh, so I, I hope I correct that introduction. Thank you for, anyway, the, the big title of professor. I'm far from that. Anyway, uh, here, here we go. I will today touch upon many, many topics. I'm very happy to be here with you today because it's my second trip, and my first trip was a wonderful introduction to Brazil uh, three, years ago, uh, three years ago, and it was a... a wonderful trip I took across, right down from south, all the way up to north, and, and still the north Amazon part, and the Salvador, the Bahia, I still have to explore. And so, wonderful to be here, here in Belo Horizonte. Uh, talking about Brazil, it's, it's almost feel like home. People are very warm, very familiar. Uh, there's a very much uh, nice way to deal here, and easy way to get, get along with people. Talking about home, here's my first, uh, first image I'm throwing up here. Uh, the world is our small home. We agree or not, but that's almost a reality. And with, with the kind of information we have today and the accessibility we have today uh, for the information, and everybody has their mobile phone in the pocket, and you have your Google Earth in your pocket. So that's our home, very fragile. And uh, there are lots of similarities we see around the world, actually, and I would like to highlight some of those similarities, and this is how uh, the world could look like, uh, which is not my ideal way of looking at the world. But I do similarities, uh, do see lots of similarities, and this might be very uh, almost on the surface similarities, but there's some truth in it. Uh, this is Rio, this is uh, the Marine Drive of Bombay, actually. If I wouldn't put that name on the top, probably wouldn't know which one is which. Uh, you go further. We also have another uh, reality, which is about the social inequality, which is as well there. This is Rio, that is the Dharavi, the one of the biggest slums in the entire Asia. So the problems are similar. The problems are complex. But anyway, they, they, they are fascinating situations. And as you very well described, we are in a very fascinating uh, point of time in history. And things could go very well, or things could also go terribly wrong. And we have to watch out that way. So. Before I talk anything further about design, I want to talk about consumption, because I think that's, that's something that bothers me a lot, because design, uh, obviously, we talk about the society being able to consume more, uh, uh, how better standard of living. But these issues are very, very complicated, actually. And often, there's only one type of business model, uh, often kind of taken as the way of uh, going ahead. And I think we have to look at another possibilities. What happens with the consumer culture is we got this very extreme scenario where people are born to just consume, actually. That's how the, the, uh, the people are treated. Even they are not called people, they are called consumers, uh, which I have a deep problem calling people consumers. You know? So the fundamental choice we have to make, uh, do we embrace the culture of consumption or we do we embrace the culture of creation? For me, the choice is very, very clear. And especially a country like Brazil, uh, the, the culture of creation and therefore this creative economy, I think has to be looked at very cr critically and not just to look at as another possibility to uh, consume more. Uh, the consumer culture, the consumer culture is a very oxymoronic culture. We all know that. Uh, we as a people have reduced down to numbers and this is just a fact. This is not a provocation, this is a reality. Uh, we are just a number in, in, in terms of the marketeers, in terms of the way the statistics are put together, and people refer as uh, just a barcode, actually. And this consumer culture, the consumption, I believe is a treatable disease, and we can take care of it. And, and especially a country like Brazil and India, where the population is huge, the geography is tremendously big, the resources are amazingly high, and the population, which is a high population, is in fact a resource now, not anymore a problem. In that case, 
we have to look at as a, as a, as a possibility to not get into these kind of scenarios. So having said that, this is a complex problem. I'm not getting into a lot of this thing. I'm also not going to make a lot of hypotheses here. I'm going to talk very much about concrete examples. And I hope people within the audience, especially the young entrepreneur peoples, people from industry, can take some of these possibilities and engage with it. And that's what I personally like to do, is to create. Uh, if we talk about uh, lots of creations and lots of possibilities we have on the planet today, often the discussion happens about and around technology, which is very important. I use a lot of it. I, I consider product of it, but also I'm very critical about it. Uh, what, what we have to really talk about technology is together with humanity. And, and problems are extremely severe. We, you know better than me uh, the problems of social justice, which is a serious problem country like India as well as Brazil faces, actually. And often there are lots of discussions, and these for me are archaic to topics, which often lots of people talk about, not south, old and new, modern and traditional, high tech and low tech. All of these, pro these issues, I think we have to go beyond that. Uh, the reason we have to go beyond that, because if you start looking at the world like that, uh, we can't go further. We need a completely refreshingly new perspective on all of these issues. And often when people discuss things like that, they, they almost refer these as a two words, you know, and so-called developing, so-called develop, whatever that means. I think we all are emerging economies. We all can learn from each other. And that perspective of collaborative mindset we need, rather than say, seeing who is winning and who is losing. I think that's a very old-fashioned perspective. Now, for me, the, the way of looking at the world has always been, and I still consider is not the nation but the world, because the world is one place. If there's a, there's a uh, let's say, nuclear disaster on one part of the world, the, it doesn't stop at the border. We all know that very well. And this is, for me, the portrait of the world, and this could be very well the portrait of Brazil, actually. And for me, that one world is the, is the idea which I always keep in my mind while dealing with the issues, actually. Uh, having said that, if you look around the world, and Brazil is a w wonderful example of that again, actually, and you travel across, especially in the remote areas, you find tremendous human ingenuity, actually, in all kinds of sorts of ways. Often in design schools and in design projects, we, we hardly acknowledge those. I mean, we could still learn a lot from these people, actually, from artisans, from uh, craftsmen, and all kinds of people. Here is one example. You see that, I don't have to tell what it is, and you see this as well, what it is actually. And to me, it's, it's a fundamental design thought, which has been there as long as the humanity has been there. So design is not particularly a new profession. I think we have to look at it as in, a, in a different way to, to how to engage with the industry and the new issues of problem of industry and the consumption. I think creation itself has never been something new. It has always been there. Uh, some other examples which you, we see fascinating example, people not having washing facilities, inventing your own uh, washing machines, actually using a bicycle mechanism, or even powering your computer and giving a kind of a service. Uh, this, these are not provocative images. These are almost realities of s some part of the uh, world we can see, and Brazil is a big part of this story. Now, within the context we are today, actually, the kind of cultural connections we have around the world, and thanks to all the delegates now flying in here for this seminar, I think the possibilities are very fascinating, and I think we have to look, look at those possibilities in a new way. And I, to understand some of those things, things can become very abstract, and sometimes it's very difficult to hold on. And I, I prefer a very concrete example, and I'm going to bring uh, two concrete examples here. And, and they have very much to do with hands-on manufacturing and something to do with product, actually, creation. Uh, here, uh, this is an image from uh, two years ago, a trip to Japan with the uh, very well-known Danish uh, designer, dear friend Ole Palsby. Uh, he's no more with us. He died, sadly, though, a year ago. And uh, this was a, a trip to a factory. This is not China. This is current Japan, actually, northeast of Japan. And if you look at the manufacturing facilities, they are not particularly different than if you could see here in Brazil or many other places, actually. Uh, so what I want to show is that this is not a rocket science. You know, this is very much hands-on things, actually. You, you see the, the industrial reality, probably a lot of, some of you here, uh, the industrialists might have these kind of settings here as well. Uh, this is an uh, ancient craft of a blacksmith. This is again in Japan. Uh, we all seen the crafts have certain values. We talked about it a lot. But 
I think the crafts also have to go and grow into a new possibilities. New possibilities in a sense of how they can be useful in today's context, not as a, some kind of old-fashioned technique, but how they can be uplifted today for in a today's context, actually. So a simple thing, uh, they're using the gas furnace, not anymore the, 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 the traditional one, and using somebody beating with a hammer, you still see it around. They use the simple uh, uh, power press, actually, to use that. So these kind of simple steps can improve a lot and bring those techniques to reality in today's context, actually. Uh, going further, and this is what I want to bring in as an example, uh, this is a bottle designed in 1953 by this man. That time he was not that old. Uh, this bottle today is, is icon for me, one of the best design. It has a beautiful detail on the top. You can, this is a soya sauce bottle, how you can control the quantity of soya you can put on your plate, actually. Now, this is produced, this is designed and manufactured in 1953. Still it is in production. Uh, around the world you can still access it, you can buy it in different supermarkets, actually. Uh, this is genuinely Japanese product, yet it's a very, very universal object, actually, to me personally. A great example of industrial design. And this is what a design can do. It d does not just generate uh, economic benefit, but eventually it creates a cultural icon, actually. I give you one even bigger icon like that as its second example. Is this is the post-World War Italy. Lots of uh, Italian also came here to Brazil during that time. We all know that. And uh, this is a shot from Vittorio De Sica's film, actually. Very much reality of a Second World War uh, Italian context. These are some manufacturing setups in Italy today. That's the LSE factory uh, a few months ago. And if you look at these kind of scenarios, they are not particularly in a context of technology, not something very, very different. What I'm talking about is design needs something else more than that, actually. And that's where we'll go to talk about. Uh, this all led to uh, an Italian I call a Vespa scooter and the lifestyle around it. We all know about it. Uh, it happened, this is the first drawing, actually, which was uh, submitted by this uh, uh, inventor. Uh, that's the man uh, who was an aviation engineer. And he used the aviation technology, how they use it after the Second World War, to produce these kind of huge panels, which does not require a huge kind of uh, tooling, uh, but used with a high pressure um, air. And just with the template, you can form the metal sheets, actually. This is the technique they devised during the Second World War. And he used that to make the scooter, which became the unisex symbol. Everybody used it. You know, rest is a history. And Without this collaboration of these people and belief in this man, this wouldn't, would never happen, actually. So industrial design indeed requires not only a designer, but it requires a great collaboration. And there are many, many, many great contemporary examples around the world, but I wanted to bring in these examples from the time when the economy was growing up, actually. And Brazil, in, in, in many ways, in that kind of curve of development, actually. Uh, going from there, I go back to the examples, as I said, talking more about the projects I'm engaged with for many years now. Uh, and that is what I'm always curious about, the culture of making things, rather than talking about design. Design eventually has to be made, has to be made real. If the idea is not massaged into reality, they evaporate and nothing stays, actually. So for me, design, the basic core of a design is a conception. And for me, conception is so critical that unless we breathe, air is critical for us, breathing is so critical in the same manner for me, the conception is so critical. So one doesn't need to talk about conception. How we translate those ideas into reality, that's a fascinating challenge, actually. Uh, here, uh, I will talk about the projects we have been engaged with, the industrial project as well as studio project. The industrial projects are the projects which I engage with collaboration, very close collaboration with industry. And that may or may not lead to industrial products. And the personal curiosity may or may not lead to some kind of edition pieces, some kind of explorations, which in turn feeds into industrial projects, actually. Now, what I say that may not lead because every time you do a new project, Whereas it has a new reality, it may not become, because if you really want to do innovation, uh, failure is an inherent part of trying to walk a new line, actually. So we, we have to really acknowledge that sometimes the project happens, sometimes not. And I will give you both the examples here. Uh, I've been always curious about design in a very, very 
uh, plural sense in a sense of creating a sensorial quality and having worked in a technological industry in transportation as well as in a electronics and digital communication I came to conclusion that we somehow miss a lot of cultural content in a, in a, in a project and, uh, and, and at that point of time I decided to go and work with uh, a tribe a, a tribe in a central India which is using very simple process of loss wax casting process and I spent two and a half years trying to understand the sensorial quality, the kind of quality of making thing they put into work which goes beyond uh, the kind of demand we have in the industrial context. Uh, why I was trying to do that, I had a very clear objective, not that I was trying to run away from industry but being critical about the industrial setting and the kind of market forces which puts a pressure on a designer to deliver. I wanted to understand how they created by their own joy, their own pride, their own skills, something. And I wanted to understand those skills, learn from them, and try to use into what I was doing actually at that point of time. This is 15 years ago. This is a very simple technique which, you, which has been seen on our planet uh, for thousands of years, how, how a basic object was made. You make a clay object, you put the wax on it, and you burn the wax, you get the lost cavity, and that's called the lost wax technique. You pour the metal in it, uh, and you get the metal object. Now, that is called a bell metal process, and that's how I started really after doing a lot of technological projects to go back to basic and try to understand how we could bring the sensorial quality in design, actually. Uh, and that led to different kind of projects, stainless steel, synthetic resin, Korean, and so forth. And so this is a basic process. What you have is you have a clay mold, you, you make a clay sort of model or a mold and you go in a forest, in a jungle, you collect the wax, the natural wax, you heat the wax, you purify the wax and here you squeeze and you make a spaghetti out of the wax and, and then you apply the wax on the top of this, that creates the pattern, then you cover it with the fine clay, then you heat the clay, the ca it creates the cavity and there you pour the metal and there you get the, the bell metal object actually. So this is exactly opposite of the industrial mass manufacturing. If you're lucky with all this hard work, if everything goes fine in this process, you get one object at the end of the process. And if you're not lucky, probably you don't get anything. You have to start again. That was a very interesting experience because that makes you extremely humble. That makes you extremely precise about what you learn. And you learn their way of technique and their, their approach when they work and kind of approach they have towards their own work actually. This is the process like you see, that's the clay uh, object, simple bowl, very, very basic. Uh, from that came lots of different objects, that's the spoon, uh, a, a set of vases, fruit bowl. And the interesting thing is because you have this wax, what I call a spaghetti, it's a kind of a coil that you make, it's a continuous process. And as I was exploring this with my curiosity, I was also exploring stereolithography, same thing what happens with the stereolithography, you have a laser building layer by layer continuously. Well, at that point of time, this was a new process, this is not anymore, we all use this for rapid prototype, eh? and this is quite cheaply available these days. But the fascinating thing is, there's a similarity between this very ancient, and this is so-called very state of art, actually. Going further, this led to project with Alessi, stainless steel, lots of different prototypes, you see here, into different thing and the story continues. This is bronze and that's the prototype with the hanger. Then it's made into gas injection molded plastic which can be again dismantled so it takes less, less packaging space and so on and so forth. So from here I go to a next project which was a very fascinating project which was started with a huge company from uh, area of Pesaro from Italy called Kurvet and they make uh, glass for architectural uh, needs like a huge glass uh, plates they make actually sheets and these glass panels actually are manufactured into quite few huge dimensions and as per the requirement of architecture project they cut those glass uh, panels into a precise dimension and ship them but suddenly they find out that quite few p pieces are kind of left over now glass as we know is a is a completely natural material they can put back in a furnace and roll back to make a few, few no, uh, new panels but one of the manager lady came out with the idea and she said, well, we could use this flat industrial glass to make something else. And they started a new company, a sister company, a small company, and invited different designers. And this was a piece. Now, this traditionally glass objects are made, as we know, in a different ways. 
uh, by blowing glass or things or pressing glass. Here, the glass is cut with the water jet in a profile. It's heated and it's bent together, and then finally it's put together to get these objects actually. So this is another way to look at, and that's where the innovation s s comes into picture of making an object. Eventually it becomes a very, very successful brand in a very short amount of time, and, and they have created a range of objects using something we could call a throwaway material, because that material would be considered in the industrial context almost like a trash. You know, That's the, the shot you see. Uh, Talking about all these things, I've been always thinking and engaging that uh, can there be another expression? Can there be another, uh, when we're talking about design in a, in, a, in a world context, we have so many different languages, so many different ways of cooking food. We have so many different musics. So why can't we have a different design language as well? And can we think and explore that sensorial quality? So that was my one of my uh, early, almost personally personal given challenge, actually. And in that process, I created this chair, what I call a horse chair, which is a continuation of that early bell metal process work, where uh, can I use this thing and uh, apply it to different kind of contexts. So that's the first thing, the form, the idea of the chair, how, how it could be, which could have a, some kind of totemic uh, uh, meaning or a symbol. Uh, and it was tried out in the same kind of process, using the same uh, spaghetti of a wax, and it was extremely difficult to cast this object. It, and we failed four times trying to cast this object. That was almost spending tons of money on trying to explore this and expand this on this material, actually, uh, without almost no support. After all these failures, actually, it took a, a complete seven and a half years to make this chair finally. And that was just the personal journey. It has nothing. Nobody involved in there, no gallery involved, no museum involved, nothing. And from that, then I made this new material because there's one, I, I happened to meet one industrialist in Italy, and she had this industrial tube manufacturing company, and we experimented with the tube, then we modeled with the tube, and after that, this is the model. We made a silicon mold, this is the wax, and we developed the same process further, and finally, no uh, uh, foundry wanted to take the risk, because when you want to cast this kind of piece, if it fails, they didn't want to, to take any guarantee that it will succeed in the same time. So we had to see foundry. We wanted to look for a foundry. We looked in India. We looked in Spain. We looked in Italy. Finally, one Italian guy came forward, and that's him, uh, Andrea. So finally, we took the challenge, and we finally cast it. So this whole process was a huge learning. And in that process of learning, there was a lot of mistakes and also understanding of how the material works, how the tactile quality works, and finally, this is the object, which is sunblasted finish here. And that's the uh, patina, which is given as a, as a dark color. Then that succeeded. Then we, once the process succeeded, we made a family of that that was designed already seven and a half years ago. But it took all of that time to make that. Now, these projects are really extreme explorations, actually. They are not the projects of industrial climb. They, the idea of doing these kind of exercises is to learn from them and how one could use it that in an industrial context. Now, going from there, this is, uh, this is another project which, uh, which went into production finally. Uh, in today's context, like we were talking this morning actually, uh, making a three-dimensional model on a computer is also a craftsmanship. I don't consider it any different than that. And that's uh, our time of craftsmanship as well, actually. Uh, this was the first prototype built by Capellini. They wanted to do it upholstery. I was against that because upholstery means that would have cost a lot more for end user in a shop because it's all manual work. I wanted it to be industrialized, made into a mold. They had to invest into mold. And obviously, industry is not quite uh, willing to invest unless they believe in idea. And that takes often so, some time. Uh, these are the first prototypes. Looking from that first prototype, we tried out then the first fiberglass. Again, talking about the, it requires that kind of rigor, the work, to make all those prototypes, to make an object a real thing. And that's the first prototype you see here, that's shown in Milan. After that, to, again, to put, make it industrialized, it took another year, and that is the 3D scanning, which in 2004 was a new technology, today it's not, it's quite accessible. And that is where the, the whole work goes into making those 3D uh, models, and from that, uh, we got this is a huge investment into industrial tooling. And this is what 
comes into an industry taking a courage, believing in an idea, and putting all their investment into a project to make it a reality. And eventually, that becomes an industrial product with uh, Kapili. Going from there, this is another project which was more as a provocation for a 50-year celebration of a company called Moroso, which is on a, a northeastern side of Italy. And the idea was to create an object which will really provoke the imagination of the kids. This was for their 50th celebration in 2002. It was designed. This is early model, which has been scanned. This is how you can sit on it. You can sit on like that, or you can sit like that as well. And when you show the project like this to kids, they never ask any question. Only the, the grown-ups ask, how, do I, how am I going to sit on this? Uh, that's the dear friend designer, Sebastian. And that's the great industri industrialist from Italy, uh, Giulio Castelli, the founder of Cartel, before uh, he passed away. Uh, going from there, I've been always curious about materials. Now, materials are very, very fascinating things. Uh, materials also have possibility to express a certain thing. But often in an industry, limitations are quite uh, strict. And then there's not much room to explore. So having gotten the possibility to explore ceramics the first time, I was very fascinated by that. But ceramic is often used for making small objects, tabletop objects. I, I wanted to challenge that and make something uh, quite a crazy idea to make a structural object like a chair. And we tried different kind of structures, possibilities, using all kind of techniques from handmade ceramics, industrial terracotta, aerospace bonding, using all these things. Uh, tried. This was the first early prototype. And that led to this industrial product, which is produced by a company, which is a small, very beautiful company in the south of Holland called Corunum, which is a vase, and it becomes a bowl. So that was one piece. This was another piece which went into production later, is uh, a steam cooking utensil produced by Bosa. And this was based on one steam cooking principle, which you have in many parts of the world. But there's one particular one in the southern part of India where they cook in a bamboo. Uh, and I took that principle to create an object. Uh, this object doesn't make a justice to see on a, on a screen. You have to use it and see how by its own weight it turns and flips that you can serve the, the food which is cooked. Uh, and it has three parts. You have a water, you have a sea when you cook. There's a small hole, so it's a steam cooker actually. Uh, it's, it's in production. It came from the, the idea of understanding something very ancient way of cooking but making an object which is very much contemporary for today's need actually. And with this kind of thing, the idea was really how we can use ceramic techniques and possibilities in making something and learning from it. So this was a skill which I wanted to explore. We all know that ha uh, hand-thrown pottery, which is quite an ancient skill, but we can learn a lot from it. And I had an opportunity to work at European Ceramic Work Center that's in the southern part of Holland. It's a beautiful center. And uh, they, they have a possibility, they invite architects and designers to engage with ceramic and create new things. And I created this, this chair, which is a kind of a crazy object. The object is, object to is not to make a chair to sit in front of your computer. This was chair as a totemic object. But when we talk about a ceramic, everybody tend to think they understand, but ceramic is a very, very complicated material. But when you talk about carbon fiber, everybody thinks about the racing cars and high tech. And what, what I did here is took a carbon fiber and put on the top of ceramic as a provocation to call it, is it a high tech or low tech? Because this debate about high tech and low tech to me seems quite meaningless. And what is more interesting thing is where we can use hammer, we need to use hammer. And where we need to use uh, iPhone, we need to use iPhone. And both have the equal importance and relevance in our society. And that is what I was trying to make a point here. So this is a very articulately made one-off piece, which is made in a ceramic, which has a carbon fiber on the top of it, actually. That's the final piece. From there, every culture we give flowers, therefore the flower offering chair, a kind of a ceremonial object. Again, this was developed into a kind of a small series production, which is produced by Bosa again. We developed this kind of a joint here, so you can literally sit on it. It will not break. And, and you can put the bunch of flowers in the back, actually. And learning from this whole experience of ceramic, which is a very complicated affair to make object in a ceramic. But if I could bring this kind of quality of glazing into mass manufactured injection molded plastic, that would be my objective of doing all these exercises. 
Uh, I will bring in another example. That this is a wood. I haven't used wood for a long time for obvious reasons. Wood is a very precious material. And I was always fascinated by a very, very simple technique of carving wood, which you find around the world. These are some images from India, and these are some ancient objects made with a very simple carving technique in India, actually. Very, very basic, can be from anywhere. Uh, very, very primal, probably 1,000 year old. And using that technique, can I create something new? This was the kind of self-curiosity to, to use that. So we created this object, what I call a kubu. It's, a, it's kind of a chest launch, so you can lie on it. It, is, it has to have an equilibrium, so it doesn't fall on your foot. It has to have a right ergonomics, and it has to have the kind of right form. So this is the final model. After this model, you see these black dots. It's scanned. And from the scanning, you got the 3D model, which is rebuilt, kind of reverse engineering. All the planning of the wood, because we're using the reused wood here, we're using the panels which are used somewhere else. This is not a solid block of wood. And that's a lot of planning making it, actually. And that's joining the wood. Machining the wood with the five axis milling machine. That's the machining the wood. And then finally, going to a craftsman, which is like a sixth generation uh, craftsman of wood. They make sculptures like this in the northeast of Italy in Bolzano. And they were very happy to collaborate on a project like this. And I worked with them. And finally, we got this kind of tactile quality, which is very hard to get in an industrial project. And that's a curiosity, actually, to lead to. And that led to this piece, actually. And that's a very, very, uh, I would say, seamless combination between the manual work and the machine work. Now, all these exercises are not just the exercises as a curiosity, but these are for me personally as a designer first and the foremost are the learning experiences to gain the knowledge, to acquire these kind of sensibilities about different materials and possibly put in a different context. Now, all these things what I've been talking about led to some kind of collaborations which go into complete different direction, but I thought I will bring in some examples where some of the very well-known brands, they collaborated to create some kind of another means of communication, uh, means of presentation, talking about some of similar values. And we did projects with all these companies which are uh, in quite, um, let's say, uh, market which is very much fashion-driven market, one could say as well. But they also concern about quality in terms of craftsmanship and some of those values. Now here is an exhibition I was invited to create and design. I call it, we can't afford to buy cheap things. Uh, because if you cheaply made things fall apart very easily, I'm not trying to be anti-democratic here. All I'm saying is rightly made object costs something a little bit more, but also lasts longer. And I think that is the kind of awareness we had to bring in. And this was an exhibition I was asked to create at, in Frankfurt Fair, which is quite a commercial fair. I was given a space, and I first thing I did is to draw this kind of a diagram for myself. Can we go back to basic, to think about object of utilities and objects of desire? And can you classify all these thousands and millions of objects we have in a fair like that, and, and kind of put them in a context that we can try to understand what we really need it, actually, and create a possibility where you can focus more on a, on a long-lasting qualities rather than a consumption. That was the layout of the exhibition. That's the exhibition. There was a critical uh, comment on uh, uh, consumerism and the kind of consumption patterns we have around the world and how they are pushed. And they're deliberately objects were chosen for their quality and their, their, their rigor in which they are manufactured and how they will last. You see here. This is another kind of uh, communication project which was done last year together in collaboration with one very big industrial house called Alcantara. They make a artificial textile invented by a Japanese in the 70s. He didn't find a manufacturer then, so he came to Italy and they, produ uh, they started producing in the central Italy, close to Rome. And this company called Alcantara, they, they created a beautiful project together with the museum called Maxi. And I thought I'll bring this example. The idea was to show this very technological um, uh, manufacturing facility, what they have close to Rome, how one could show that in a very poetic manner that people can relate, normal people who go to see that can try and understand that. Now, the, the textile which is produced here is made with the millions of microfibers, actually. And the manufacturing is a beautiful place to see 
uh, how, how they create these microfibers and how they weave those microfibers into a textile. And uh, we experimented this with this piece. There are lots of colors possible. There are lots of possibilities with this thing. And talking about the, the possibility of looking at certain thing which is extremely technological into a completely refreshing manner. And here is an example. So the idea here is to create this kind of uh, endless installation where you have uh, a possibility to, to bring back that memory of manufacturing, which is extremely technological, to uh, making and installing something. So we found a way how we could have a six degree angle for the, for the mirror and you get this continuous reflection, showing that endlessness, which is you see in the manufacturing process. Now, this is achieved by making an aluminum platform here at six degrees and putting this thing, which was amazing work uh, in terms of making those microfibers and installing it, and that's the end result, actually. So actually, the idea of creating something like this is another way of showing the complexity of manufacturing, which is extremely uh, out of this world, in a way, for everyday user. But how can we show that and relate to everyday life, actually, and show it in a, some kind of installation? So this was shown at uh, Milan last year, last summer, uh, in Maxi in Rome, at the museum. Uh, having done all these different projects, my first love remains industrial design. Design, uh, which is uh, a serious challenge, which is to be made at the appropriate accessible price, quality, and which could be distributed in a, in a bigger numbers. And that has always been my curiosity. Having done all these experiences and experiments, the main objective remains is to create projects for industry, where people can access it and easily acquire it and also built in that quality and have that idealism that you can afford it, actually. Now, having said that, industrial projects are difficult projects because industrial projects require a lot more challenge. You require collaboration. You require trust from industry. And they have to put an investment within the idea of a designer. Now, here I'm, I'm going to show you an example. This was done together quite some years ago. This was already in 2003 a bamboo project together with the government of Philippines. It was coordinated from New York. Uh, it was called Transformation. And from lots of natural materials from the Ministry of Industry, from the Philippines government, they gave access to all the materials. And the idea was to create industrial product using these natural materials. And this is what I did is to engage with them and create a bamboo sound panels, which could be used in a architecture. So that's a hand-woven bam uh, bamboo panel, which has a foam core inside, which absorbs the sound when you use it in the interior of architecture. And that's the bamboo panel, actually. And bamboo has some very beautiful quality. And bamboo grows uh, incredibly fast compared to the tree. And it's extremely sustainable material, like we all know. And these are some of the examples. This is another bamboo panel to be used in architecture. This is another panel and we did lots of these prototypes and I bring in this example typically particularly here in Brazil because this was a failure uh, the reason it was a failure because there were too many bureaucratic governmental complications and uh, not because of the design but in terms of implication uh, Im implementation of the project taking those ideas and implementing them in a local context of Philippines it became extremely complicated and in the complications, the project got lost. In a bureaucracy, the project was never seen. And I really hope, with the op optimism we have here in Brazil, such things are taken care of, that they, they really see light of the day. And eventually, the project become real, actually. Because the possibilities are endless, but eventually, there are all the collaborating partners put their energy into and belief into it. Uh, things never become reality. And this is an example of a failure I wanted to bring in, because when you have uh, several partners and collaborators, things could often fail as well. Uh, from there, I give you another example of extremely successful industrial collaboration with a Swedish company uh, called Vavriet. I was invited to design a textile. And it is a, a factory, which is a revival of textile manufacturing in the area of Baros, which is very close to the automotive industry in Gothenburg in the central part of Sweden somewhere. And the idea was to create um, a textile which is made with the natural wool. 
and it, which is extremely ecological in terms of how they use, how they dye the material and so forth. So uh, the idea is based on the meanders, which you see lot, lots of them in a northern uh, hemisphere actually. The, from that came the idea of uh, making a 3D textile, how it's over, and this is a computer drawing, it's a sketch. Uh, from that, all these prototypes happening, and that's the industrial manufacturing. You see that that's a real serious industrial manufacturing, tremendous investment. You see the, the dyeing process and the colors they use, the natural, and how they get certified as ecologically sustainable products. I like her red, red shoes. This could have been also in Brazil. So this is, this is the textile, which is really a serious industrial manufacturing in terms of uh, conceiving a project, making it real, and getting into industrial production, actually. I'm always fascinated by architecture. Architecture and design are very closely linked. I'll show you some examples of project. This is a project, again, done with a company called Colombo. It's a door handle. Seems like a humble object, but it, it's a serious manufacturing. This is an investment to robotic manufacturing, actually. This initial sketch model, this is the final product. That's the range of door handles. And you see this a detail here that it's a sensorial detail that you allows you to touch and open the door because door handle you never really look at, you just hold with your hand, you feel it. Again, project like this is intended to manufacture for a long time. It is not something you just ma create and, and trash it after six months or something. The objective of a project like this, because there's a serious industrial investment, that it stays in a production for years to come. There's another example of uh, another industrial project, and I wanted to show and emphasize that industrial side actually, is a my, uh, project done together with the mass manufacturing company who specialize in extrusion manufacturing, aluminum extrusion. This is a basic joint which is designed in terms of three components. They all are extruded, though they don't look like one. And uh, this is the basic assembly. This is the product development team sitting in Bologna. This is the first rapid prototype. This is the mass manufacturing line. And in extrusion manufacturing, one has to think about all the possibilities beforehand, before you invest into tooling. So finally, when it's made, it just has to fit together. It has to just fit. And here is the, the production line. And that's the one, one of the final results. You can very sh uh, ship this kind of object in a fat pack and assemble on a site. It's extremely sturdy. And it becomes a range of objects. So there is a minimum investment into three parts of extrusion, and from that you get the industrial product. And that is the industrial thinking where by making appropriate investment and by making the right choices of technology, how can we create an industrial product? And that has always been my curiosity. Then we use the bamboo panel here instead of a glass. This is another project, another industrial project, but the reality here is a completely handmade. It's a Swedish company called Hestens. They still make the bait since 1852, uh, still by hand. They invited me to create an installation once to use their bed. They argue that as the one of the most comfortable bed in the world. And they also um, wanted, actually, to create a kind of a scenography where you show that kind of a comfort. So this was a dream bedroom created, they invited me to their factory, and I was always curious to understand the kind of technique they have. They have this kind of a double spring mechanism, and from that, I wanted to create another object of comfort, a sofa for them as well. And it took them a time to understand, but then they got really excited by that to try to diversify their business in a very systematic manner and create object which could become a complement to their sofa, actually. Now, they have these kind of Viking-looking guys uh, working in a factory. They use uh, a lot of horse hair. This is a natural ship wool. Every material is a natural. They, use, they give a lifelong guarantee on a product. So that's really sustainability pushed to the extreme other limit. It become an extremely luxurious object. Uh, you see the, all that handwork. This is the man. is the chief of their product development. That's the lady head of their upholstery. And they are very proud of this checks, which is their kind of brand identity. And <laughs> that's the final result. So the idea was actually to create using the same kind of technique, which is manufacturing technique. And the, the thing they 
perfected all these years, can be used in a different way. So it's a subtle innovation, a sidestep, which opens up a new possibility, new, new kind of area for them. Here I'm going to show you one of the last projects. And now often industry spends a tremendous amount of wrong things. Allow me to say that. Lots of money on, on advertising, but very little investment on creation. Uh, I'm not the management council, neither I want to be one. But if you, one company creates and puts investment into a product itself, a product creation, the possibilities one gets in terms of communication are endless. Uh, but the innovation one has to really invest into has to believe in it. And here is, I was given a chance, this is quite some years ago, a company, a very small company, and north of Venice, uh, manufacturing humble radiators. Uh, you don't have much radiators in this part of uh, Brazil, but you have it in the southern part of Brazil, uh, where it's a bit colder. So the radiators are always stuck in a corner, and they are they take all the heat which goes in the in the in the wall actually. So I, w I was thinking about a radiator as a model where the air could pass through, and it can integrate in architecture in a seamless manner that it gives you the the the, the warmth where you really need. At the same time, it will tremendously save the amount of energy it needs to heat up, actually. This is a serious industrial design project where it requires tremendous amount of critical thinking in terms of how to make this thing work. Because this is not just something to make it look beautiful. It has to work because it has a serious uh, safety regulations on it. If it breaks, in reality, the company can become hasty in one day. So the implications on safety are tremendously high. The manufacturing the standards are extremely high, uh, therefore the industrial reality is complicated. So in this case, what we did is we did lots of prototypes using tremendously different materials, traditionally never used for radiator like ceramic, pressed glass, all the way to aluminum. And here we have aluminum used in a, a very many different kind of ways. That's the first prototypes, so you're studying it. These are tremendous amount of meetings, meeting after meetings, in terms of talking to all the peoples, because it's a huge investment in the project. Talking about technicality, one has to understand all the technical complexity of the project, the hydraulics, how it's going to work. And then there's a huge investment because it becomes an industrial reality. And that is the, the, the production, the robotics, testing, assembling, the uh, temperature control, again testing, that the assembly line, and that's the final product. That is, opens up a complete new dimension of a, of a radiator which could be used in a different way. It can also become seamless part of architecture. You can use it as a space divider, and so on and so forth. So they were so happy they wanted me to f photograph with the radiator as well. OK, that's all. If you like, I have one more thing, if you have a time. Do you want one more thing? The last bit? Yeah? OK, this is a bit of a fun, but also a serious fun. This is last year a project initiated by an artist, a visual artist, uh, funded by the Ministry of Culture and some kind of artistic initiative. The idea is, what will be the life on the moon? Seems like a crazy idea, but it could become reality within our lifetime. Uh, traveling to space almost ha has become already a reality. So I was. Uh, taking once a summer vacation, uh, drawing aquarelle in a s tiny village in, in uh, Sweden called Skarlholm. They have a nice watercolor museum there. I spent a week there. I used to drink a coffee at this place, a lady giving me coffee every day. And there was something written here, which I couldn't really read in Swedish. Probably Rasmus, you could read it in Swedish, and you see what it means. And I, I read her, and I asked her after second day, what does it mean? And it really, it, it says contribution to a personal uh, for space travel. So any tip you want to give there, you put it there for, the, for her to go to the space. This sounds like a fun, but this is a serious fun. This is serious stuff. People believe in it. And that is, could become a reality, like I said. And the idea was, I was invited together with other designers and architects, what would be the life on the moon? And I wanted to create an object which will provoke certain kind of imagination and make people think about certain things, but also create some kind of basic object for a living. And that was the idea. Today, moon is not just the dead object, but it could also be a resource. There could be a lot of minerals, materials, possibilities, actually. That's the reality. So 
what would be that life on a, in a microgravity? That was the idea. Now, having the problems we have on our planet Earth and the kind of amazing archaic issues we fight every day, we know that. I, I always say that it will be great if everybody get to go to the moon and see the beautiful Earth rise, our silly problems will go away, actually. And people will think bigger. And I know very well that if everybody goes to the moon, that will be a disaster. Uh, but anyway, this is the reality. You know, Professor Stephen Hawkins was taken by this man to the space uh, to prove that if this man can go, every grandmother can go to the space as well, actually. This was experienced like zero, zero gra gravity by Dr. Peter Diamandis, who launched the company for experiencing the gravity, and later the well-known X Prize of 10 million US dollars. So, going to space ha is almost lots of companies are engaged with this. Privately funded initiatives are happening, and so forth. This man was visiting us in Amsterdam. It was a great encounter. It was a great uh, discussion, discourse with him in a, in, a, in a studio here in Amsterdam. And that led, all this thinking led to a project, as I was already thinking about the project when I was in Sweden. The idea here I'm trying to explain, not getting into scientific details, when you go in a, in a microgravity or a zero gravity, your vision or perception, angle of vision changes. It uh, becomes bigger in a vertical plane and it becomes shorter in a horizontal plane. Now, this is the experience. Now, presuming the fact that today we travel, the way we travel with the aeroplane is, is easier than taking a taxi or taking a bus, actually. It, in the same manner, in our lifetime, I believe, we'll be able to go to, uh, in outer space without any training, without any problem, without any uh, special condition. In that sense, to experience that life in a microgravity, what will be the object we'll need? And that was my curiosity to create for this kind of project. So to understand this perception difference in our, the way we pursue the reality on a planet Earth and the moment we go in a, in a microgravity or a zero gravity, how will you perceive? So I created a walking gauge, I call a uh, microgravity object, which has a small viewfinder here, which, which you can measure angle. Now the question of measuring a distance on the moon, we need to invent a new scale. So I did one. Now we need to switch off the lights if you could. Can we? Is it possible to switch off the light so you can see it properly? For a second? Yeah, it's possible? Otherwise, you won't see anything at all. Can, can the translator tell that? We need to switch off the light for a second. Or do we have to come back tomorrow, maybe? Yeah, shall I go ahead? OK, we're not going to see, because it's it's object made up of a transparent acrylic. It, it's object made up of a transparent acrylic, and you need an extreme dark surface because there's a spotlight you can't see it yeah it's possible to can somebody translate them that we need a just to switch off the light nothing more <laughs> There you see that. That's the, that's the object, how it will look on the moon surface. It's very articulately made object. It balances like that on a planet Earth. So that was quite some engineering to get it made. And, uh, and it has a fine balance. So it's kind of provoked the imagination that it almost become microgravity on our planet Earth. Uh, it has this marking. There's a unique scale on the top, like you see here. That's the front view. Uh, that's the grip force, how the, 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 the making of it is so finely made that you see that. This is the viewfinder. You see through this. It's designed on the earth, so those are the coordinate of the uh, studio. And the idea here is that it should be manufactured on the moon, so that's why to be made on the moon. And it has a different kind of scales. 
Thank you very much. Obrigado.